I guess the first thing to say is there are consequences of general relativity, that when you get as far as writing down the equations of general relativity and start trying to solve them, you find that some of the solutions involve these wave solutions. The distortions of the space-time that propagate out. I mean, they're important for lots of reasons. They're important because they are a prediction of, of general relativity. So actually, if you then detect them, you've found further confirmation that general relativity is actually right. Whenever matter passes by through some region of space-time, it will distort the space-time. Just like you would distort water when you, if you put your fingers through water and, and waves propagate out, this is a propagation of the space-time itself. So the space-time is, is sort of moving in and out propagating out at the speed of light. But also because, in principle at least, they open up an entire new window on the universe. Everything, almost everything we've done in astronomy, barring a few cosmic rays and neutrinos, has been mediated through light. We've used light to figure out what's going on in the universe. Having an entirely new way of detecting what's going on out there in the universe is a very exciting thing for astronomers because it, it opens up all sorts of new avenues for us to pursue in research. As the Earth goes around the Sun, then the space-time is, is distorting around the Earth and that's, and that's propagating out in waves in all directions. But those waves have nothing to do with, for example, why the Moon is attracted to No, the no, they're different gravity. That, that, that's a different uh, aspect. Sometimes we call them gravitational waves, but they're, they're different here. These are, the, the tides don't um, exist because of the nature of gravitational waves uh, propagating. You've got the Earth going around the Sun and then you've got the Moon going around the Earth. These are very massive objects, right? And so there's a net attraction just due to the pure mass of these objects. And that's where the tides come from. The large mass of the Moon and the even larger mass of the Earth and as they go around, the water that's on the Earth gets distorted by the changing gravitational field due to the huge mass of the Moon and the Earth. But on top of that, there's like a secondary effect going. As, as, as the moon is going around, it's, it's causing ripples in the space-time. And it's those ripples, th th these are minuscule ripples that are propagating out. And it's those that recently were detected, not from the moon, but from uh, two massive, supermassive, well not supermassive, two massive black holes that were orbiting each other. And so they distorted the space-time enough that these waves that propagated out they, they could be detected here on Earth. I said space is expanding and contracting, but the amount that space is expanding and contracting by is absolutely minuscule. So this big result that came up with this thing that they detected, the amount by which space was expanding over the many kilometers of their detector was less than the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. So it's an absolutely tiny effect. That's why we don't sort of notice them going past, because if they were big effects, you know, you'd see kind of space doing all sorts of weird things. But because they're so tiny, we just don't see them. It's just amazing. I mean, the numbers involved, the timing involved, it's a spectacular event. So a billion light years away, <laughs> 450 megaparsecs away. So a billion years ago, two black holes, which were each of them 30 times the mass of the Sun, okay? Which is unusual apparently in its own right to get this kind of combination. They were orbiting. They'd been orbiting each other for probably millions of years anyway. Well, they have to be bound together because they were in orbit around one another. And it's actually quite complicated because, so the way you get massive black holes is you have some very massive star exploding in a supernova. And unless that supernova is set up very carefully, if you imagine you had a pair of binary star binary star in orbit around one another, one of them goes supernova. If you're not very careful, that's going to unbind the system because you've lost the whole load of mass, there's all sorts of energy being transferred between one and the other. So somehow the two managed to stay bound together, it would seem, when first one went supernova and then a bit later the other went, went supernova. I say a bit later, you know, probably tens to hundreds of thousands of years later the other one went supernova. Alternatively, possibly, if both of these stars were in a cluster, they might actually have individually been separate stars and at some point in the subsequent evolution they might have actually got sufficiently close together that they end up capturing each other and end up in a binary system that way. So it is a little bit of a mystery how you make these two massive black holes, fairly massive not super massive black holes, in orbit around one another in the first place, but there are at least kind of plausible mechanisms for doing it. So they're doing this for millions and millions of years and then in the final, I think it's 0.2 of a second <laughs> as they're coming closer and closer together they start going so rapidly around one another, they begin to approach the speed of light, in fact something like 60% of the speed of light. These are 30 solar mass black holes. As they're coming closer and closer, 
When they're about, I think, 350 kilometers apart, they basically start merging together. Amazingly, from just looking at the kind of signal they detect, they can learn a great deal about the kind of black holes it actually was, how the amplitude changes with time, how the frequency of the signal changes with time. So in this case, they're fairly confident that one of them was a 29 solar mass black hole and the other one was a 36 solar mass black hole. They've got sort of errors of one or two solar masses on each one, but they are both 30 to 40 solar mass black holes. So those are the kind of black holes which are probably the end states of very massive stars. Although they are actually on the high side even for very massive stars. Remember we've, we've talked about this intricate link between the matter and the space-time. Just imagine, trying to imagine these two huge objects, what they're doing to the matter, to the space-time around it. As they, and the space-time must be going, oh my god, what's happening here? And it's flipping up and down, up and down. And they're just generating these waves are beginning to propagate out. 350 kilometers is about the distance what to London. Then you've got two 30 solar mass black holes sort of orbiting one another in this region. And so they're going and at close to the speed of light. So the, 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 the space time in which it's evolving it must be going, having huge distortions associated with it. And so it begins to send out gravitational waves. They've been happening all the time but at a much lower amplitude because they've not been feeling this effect like this. And then the, 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 these two black holes keep coming in together and they merge. And what happens is when you've got two black holes they'll merge into a bigger black hole. So one of them is 29 solar masses, the other one is 36 solar masses. If you add those two together you get 65 solar masses. So you would think by merging these two together you make a 65 solar mass black hole. Turns out they can also tell you what the mass of the black hole they ended up with was again just by looking at the kind of signal, and it's not 65 solar masses, it's about 62 solar masses. And the reason why is because three solar masses has disappeared, and via Einstein's famous formula, E equals mc squared, those three solar masses of energy have all been turned into the energy of the gravitational waves. So three solar masses via E equals mc squared has been turned into a huge amount of energy liberated in this gravitational wave explosion. And in fact, if you work out what the luminosity of the thing was, how bright it was in gravitational waves, in that fraction of a second as all this happened, it was brighter, it was liberating more energy, more power than all the stars in the entire observable universe for that fraction of a second, all in gravitational waves. But there was no light. No, well, there may, have been, uh, well, there may well have been some light as well, but that was just what was coming out in gravitational waves. Most of the energy of this merger was coming out in these sudden bursts of gravitational waves. They're travelling now, they've got a billion years, they're travelling all directions, they propagate and then as it happens there's a detector, <laughs> two detectors in America, they've been recently updated and they've just been turned on, they were doing, I think they call it the engineering run, they haven't even started doing the proper science run, they've been turned on for a few weeks and a few billion years later these waves are coming through, now they've lost a lot of their energy, right, as, just as light loses its energy and, and becomes dimmer and dimmer, the, the, the huge amplitude associated with the waves early on is now dimmed down, 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 down. They pass through this detector and the detector consists of two arms, four kilometer long arms. An interferometer, a classic interferometer, has two arms to it and you basically shine a light down each arm, usually a laser because you want it to be nice coherent light, and in essence you, you shine the light backwards and forwards along each of these arms. By recombining the light you can essentially tune the thing so that the two arms are exactly the same length as each other. Okay, and, and if you set up your interferometer right, then the light that's gone down this arm and the light that goes down this arm exactly cancel each other out so you end up with no signal at all. Okay, and so that's a, a thing called a nulling interferometer. It's set to, you get zero signal when the two arms are actually tuned in that way. Now, of course, when one of these waves goes past, in one direction it actually causes a contraction and in the other direction it actually causes an expansion. This back and forth stretching and squeezing happens over and over until the wave has passed. As the wave goes past, by this tiny, tiny amount, the arms will no longer be exactly the same length. And the effect of that is then that exact cancellation ceases to work and suddenly some of the light gets through your interferometer. So the way they actually detect it is that they actually start seeing light in their, in their interferometer because the arms have changed in length by that tiny amount. This huge amount of energy required this desperately accurate <laughs> detector in order to be able to find the gravitational waves. And then you might ask, how do you know you've found gravitational waves? Surely everything distorts. It seems like an instrument that a mosquito sneezing would affect them. Uh, and the, they get huge numbers of false positive detections. So any kind of uh, earth tremor, 
uh, truck driving by, all those kinds of things produce signals that they end up detecting in these interferometers. There's two things that save them. One is that actually it has the, the things that you're looking for, so things like these black hole signature, have a very characteristic shape to them, that the way that the, the oscillations increase and decrease in amplitude with time has this very classic signature to it that tells you the kind of thing you're looking for. So they know what sort of thing to look for. And then the second thing that saved them is that there isn't just one interferometer, there's two working at the same time, a large distance apart from one another. And so the chances of the same pathological truck going past both of them at the same time producing something that looks exactly like a black hole merger signature is at that point astronomically small. So they can, by doing this kind of coincidence thing of detecting it in both detectors almost simultaneously, tells them that actually they have detected a real astrophysical result. One of the upsides to actually having two detectors, if the gravitational wave is coming from over here somewhere, it will hit one detector first and then a bit later it'll hit the other detector. So the wave came through, hit Louisiana first, <laughs> and then the, li the light travel time, because they're going at the speed of light, it then passed through uh, the Washington detector, exactly the same profile, you know, seven milliseconds later, which corresponds to the light travel time. And that enabled them to sort of give an estimate of where in the sky this original thing had started from. So for example, this thing that they've detected, they know it's somewhere in the southern hemisphere. They can't say much more than that. It's somewhere in the southern sky. This is about as close as they can get, but they do at least get some directional information. When they start getting third and fourth detectors up, obviously that will give them more information, so they'll actually be able to triangulate much more exactly where these sources are. Potentially an issue for the, uh, the gravitational wave community, it could be that we're on the verge of being inundated now with black hole, bin neutron star, black hole binaries, sort of all, all of a sudden they're everywhere <laughs> and we just hadn't had the sensitivity to detect them and now poof, no one really knows how many there are out there because they, we, all that we have to work on are theories where you estimate how many you expect there to be. So the, I was reading the, you know, the expecting of order 40 a year but hey we may have got that wrong it may be 4,000 or something in which case you have a bit of a, you're a different issue <laughs> you have a like a, an LHC issue where you've got so many collisions how are you going to extract out the interesting physics here you know where the Higgs coming from here you might just have so much radiation coming gravitational waves coming in from all of these binary systems that we think we understand the binary systems and we're now interested in finding the, the weird and wonderful early universe features that might be, a, well that would be a nice problem to have, I think. About black holes is you've got two very massive objects and they're in orbit, if, they're, if you've got a pair of them in orbit around each other, so a binary black hole system, of course when something's moving around on a circular orbit, is this actually accelerating? See, they were unlucky, right? They, they were in their shutdown mode when this gravitational wave passed through. It travels for a billion years. It was, there, those detectors were up and running maybe a few months earlier, but they just shut down and they pass yeah, through. Blink and you miss it. Blink and you miss it.